thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you in particular, Anil. Come on, there are seats in front, please. OK, so uh, I assume that you know that there are elements all around us, chemical elements. And we have tried to arrange this in a particular form that is called a periodic table. And hopefully, at some point in your life, you may have seen a periodic table hang on a chemistry lab somewhere or in school or something. You've seen a periodic table. The two things I want you to take back home today are that there is not one periodic table, but there are periodic tables. There's an S over here. They'll show you many periodic tables, of which there is one sort of official one, but there are many periodic tables. The other thing is, this periodic table of the elements is not just the elements found on Earth over here, but it's the periodic table of the universe. Universe. So with this, uh, before I get started, I should do some shameless inter uh, advertising as well. As has already been announced, I run this thing called Chai and Y. And the best part about Chai and Y is we are live. So even if you're in, in Rurki, you can follow us on the first Sunday, third Sunday. If a month has a fifth Sunday, fifth Sunday, 11 o'clock, we are on Facebook and we are live. So you can like us, you can uh, follow us, Facebook and Twitter, it's at Chai and Y. You can follow whatever is happening live on Facebook. Or you can watch it on YouTube, the same channel name, Chai and Y. Uh, it gets uploaded on YouTube usually on Mondays. So this year is the UN's International Year of the Periodic Table because it marks 150 years since the most famous periodic table. And that is by this gentleman, Dmitry Mendeleev. This is his periodic table from 1869. And we are celebrating 150 years of it. But it's not just his periodic table. Lots of people have made contributions. It's also, we have finally agreed that the seventh row of the period is complete. We've named all the elements. So that's also a good reason to celebrate uh, the year of the periodic table. OK. Um, I thought in IIT, they always give quizzes. So I should also start with a quiz. OK, a very qu quick quiz. Uh, there are a few fun questions that are going to come up in the talk. They will come up periodically in the talk. OK, and the answers, of course, are not difficult because it's all elementary stuff. You get the hint. Um, and don't shout off your answer. Raise your hand. OK, here's a list of six elements. Very quick. Francium, germanium, gallium, indium, nihonium, polonium. One of these is not named after the country. Which one? Somebody. Indium. Indium. Very good. Why? It's the indigo color in the spectrum. Very good. Very good. Very good. OK. Who is this person? He's the only living person after whom an element is named. So either the element or the person. The only living person after whom an element is named. Clearly, it's got to be a recent element. This is Yuri Oganesian, after whom Oganesson, the last in the noble gases row, is named element 118. OK. So before we start, just remember, I am not an expert in any of this. I don't work on, I'm a semiconductor physicist. I don't work on periodic tables or on chemistry or on astronomy. I'll tell you lots of astronomy stuff, nuclear physics. I know very little. Uh, but I like telling stories. So I'm going to tell you some stories. OK. Uh, so thanks. I've copied a lot of stuff from lots of sites available on the net in this year of the periodic table. And also, especially Rajib, who helped me make many of these samples, sealing them in quartz, et cetera. OK. Now, how did I get into all this? When I was a kid, uh, it, it was um, the days where the only books you could afford were books. There was no internet. There were very nice books from Mir Publishers Moscow, uh, translated into English. And these books were uh, you know, all um, about chemistry. Why not just Russians? The Americans did well also. There's Uncle Sachs with Uncle Tungsten, Un Oliver Sachs, Uncle Tungsten. And the good thing is today, you can find all of these PDFs online. So if you want to read them, they're there. So there are lots of these books, which are very, very nice to read. And uh, let's see. You can recognize this. What's this? Yeah, do you see a table? <laughs> it's a periodic table table. OK. Uh, and um, this is by Theodore Gray. It's a very nice site. You can go to this, and you can lift each of these and learn something about the elements and all that. Highly recommend it. Now, the periodic table is no longer just restricted to chemistry. It's an icon of science. Every time somebody wants to categorize something, they make a periodic table. OK? And everything has a periodic table. Now, I didn't know whether this would be an adult-only audience or not, so I didn't, couldn't show the best ones. But you can have the periodic table of sports cars. Even better, you have the periodic table of deserts. And here you have all the sweeteners, sugar, honey, corn syrup, maple syrup, etc., butter, milk, cream, all the fats on this side. VS is vanaspati shortening. You have. <laughs> Lemon, lime, orange, apple, banana, apricot, all the fruits, marsala, toke, brandy, whiskey, rum, etc., all the alcohols, <laughs> pecan, cashew, pistachio, all the nuts. So people arrange anything in a periodic table. They also show you spectra of elements. They also give you crystal structures, like bread is flour and air, 
you add flour and butter in sheets, you get puff pastry sheets, and ice cream has got some air and something else. Uh, this, it's fun, but it's nice. OK. But the periodic table we'll talk about today is this one, which has all the elements arranged in a particular order. And you can learn a lot by shading the periodic table in many ways. So in this case, they've shaded the, the alkali metals, alkaline earth, the D-block guys, the uh, lanthanides, actors. they're all shaded in different colors. But we can shade them in many different ways. Here we have shaded them. The red ones were the ones which were known since antiquity. Many of them are just found in the natural state. Uh, the last four are the last purple ones which finished the seventh period. Uh, you know, so the yellow ones were known, uh, like the dark yellow ones were when Lavoisier was there, the light yellow ones were when Mendeleev was there. So you can shade them historically. You can do many things to play with the periodic table. You can also try and put pictures of the elements, or even better, you can you know, try and uh, make real periodic tables with elements. I am an element collector. I mean, I have been fascinated by elements since I was a kid. My favorite group is actually yttrium, ytterbium, terbium, erbium. Why? Because they all get their name from the same village. The village is Iterbi in Sweden. From Iterbi, you get Yttrium, Iterbium, Terbium, Erbium. Um, a nice set. And I, you know, like Scandium. You always wondered. All through chemistry, I never knew what, if Scandium was any useful. <coughs> Till I found out much later that, yes, you can make some use of it. OK, so I was collecting stuff. And eventually, I put together for the year of the periodic table whatever we could find. And uh, we have now a little more than this. Um, and you know it's been very popular. People come and see it and take selfies with it and all that stuff. So anyway, things I could not really bring in bulk. I have got some in glass tubes, as I've already told people who came early. Uh, so calcium, for example, is actually a very shiny metal, but it's very difficult. The moment you break it and take it out and try and seal it, it just gets uh, oxidized. But we have some. This is cerium. This is a nice big block of cerium. This is lanthanum. And I know the question that most people will ask me is, you know, why is there no uranium? I won't really wanted to see uranium. Actually, I have uranium, but I just didn't feel like, you know, going through this airport security. If they asked me, what's that? Oh, that's uranium. Um, and, you know, uh, it was not worth taking that risk. Uh, uranium actually is, you can buy it, there's no problem. They typically come in metal turnings like this. If you've ever done lathe work, you know what these things come from, because it's used to make penetrators for weapons, so they machine it. That's what you get it. It'll become black very easily because it's a very, very reactive metal. Uh, and uh, what you need to do is you take it, you clean it, you melt it, and you can get these nice shiny uh, balls of uranium uh, that are used for experiments. Okay, so uranium is a very nice shiny metal, but it, it, will, it will become black almost instantly in air. So it's stored under oil or kerosene like they do for sodium. It's very, very uh, easily oxidized. Anyway, so uh, uh, let's get back to this today. A uh, question for you is going to be, uh, which are the ones over here? We don't have 43 and 61. We don't have technetium and promethium. Why? Why don't we have technetium and promethium? They are among the naturally occurring elements. Two what? Are two? Rare? two? Rare? No, 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 they're not too rare. There are others which are way rarer. But whatever promethium, they are the two radioactive elements within the first 92. And whatever was there in the formation of the Earth is over. Their half-lives are such that it's all over. So all the promethium and technetium available now is artificially produced. OK. So I didn't bring these two. I couldn't find them. I couldn't find, I couldn't bring the gases. I mean, I could seal them in tubes, but you won't believe me. So it's not <laughs> worth it. Uh, unless I have some X-ray spectroscopy or something to sh prove to you what it is. I didn't bring the reactive metals. I didn't, you're not allowed to carry sodium, potassium on flights and all that. So not a good thing anyway. Uh, I didn't bring the radioactive ones or the artificially produced ones. So what is left is what you have here. OK, these are the ones we have in over here. One question I'm going to ask you, I'll give prizes or do something. I, I normally give periodic tables, so I don't bring them, but I'll email, email them to you. I have nice periodic tables. Uh, is which is the most expensive? Which is the most expensive element in this whole lot? Which is the most expensive element? Tell me later. No, don't worry. Unless you're sure, sure of it, you can shout now. Yeah? Cesium. No, no, no. Cesium is not expensive. OK. Uh, and it's not here anyway, of the ones which are here. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you later. So before that, before we get any further, let's make sure we understand what is an element. What is an element? Well, let's look at oxygen. Now, I can think of oxygen as something which has atomic number 8. Hence, it has 8 protons. It has 8 electrons around it. It's arranged 2s, 1s, 2, 2s, 2, whatever, 2p4, something. right? And it's got some you know, xy coordinates in this group and this column of the periodic table. 
I can also think of oxygen in a more chemistry-like way, saying that this is a gas. It liquefies at minus 183. It supports combustion, etc. The chemical properties of things. And both are right. OK? And this is the way things have been happening, uh, whether you look at a physics approach to it or a chemistry approach to it. And all the new elements are essentially discovered through nuclear physics methods. But it's the chemistry guys who have the right to name them. So the IUPAC is the guy who names them. They keep fighting about who should get the rights to name them. Nature publishes papers on this battle between physics and chemistry, etc. Uh, but it still goes on. And what is remarkable is this next quiz question, which is, how long should an element exist before we can call it an element? And because KBC is on, I even decided to give you four choices. So is it a microsecond, a, a millisecond, a picosecond, 10 femtoseconds? How long should it be stable before I can call it an element? Picosecond. Picosecond. A mil yeah? We agree? Well, it's actually 10 femtoseconds. Because they say that 10 femtoseconds is the time that a nucleus needs to capture the electrons to form an atom. Physicists are happy. They measure one atom, two atom, done. We've discovered element. The chemistry guy says, what the hell, man? With 10 femtoseconds or even microseconds, you can't do any regular chemistry kind of stuff, right? The chemistry guy would like to make chlorides and nitrates and you know, study their properties and all. You can't do that if your half-life is microseconds. But anyway, right now, rules are 10 femtoseconds. Good. So uh, Earth, oh, by the way, I just forgot. There are two boxes of white powders out here. These are one of the best purchases I've done in TIFR. I filled out all the paperwork. This is legally obtained uranium ore and thorium ore from the International Atomic Energy Agency. That's the closest I could get, the stuff that I can carry around. Uh, so initially, we had this earth, air, fire, water. Every culture has tried to see what is around. Today, we have 118 elements. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a very brief chem history. OK, chem history of what happens. And we will start with Robert Boyle. You've heard of Boyle and Boyle's law, certainly. So Boyle was working with gases. And air was the first of these ancient elements, which was analyzed and found to be many different things. So we start with Boyle. Boyle also incidentally wrote the first chemistry textbook. He wrote this textbook called A Skeptical Chemist in 1661. And here he tried to define an element. He tried to define an element, saying that it is something which I cannot reduce or analyze to something simpler. Now, the problem with this is it depends on how good you are at analysis. Right? Maybe you know how to break up something into something else. Maybe you don't. So depending on that, you'll know whether it's an you can call it an element or not. And uh, um, so air is the first one. The gases, Boyle is working on gases. Gases are the first things to be analyzed. And very soon, air breaks up into different components. Many people working. The first one is, is carbon dioxide. In 1750, they find a gas that you know, puts out uh, uh, fires. Uh, Cavendish discovers some gas that burns. It's hydrogen. Uh, Rutherford, this is not the Rutherford or the scattering Rutherford. This is a much older Rutherford. He discovers that some component of air, he calls it noxious or poisonous because rats die. In those days, you could do these experiments without ethical committees and all that. He doesn't know it's because there's no oxygen, but he assumes that this is the gas that actually kills them. So he calls it noxious air. Sheila and Priestley discover oxygen a few years later, and they call it fire air or vital air because it's necessary for life and it's necessary for burning. And you know, science always progresses through various false paths before we cut to the right one. So there are wrong theories about how things burn in this phlogiston theory, etc. Eventually, 1777, Lavoisier decides that oxygen is an element. And Lavoisier, you've heard of Antoine Lavoisier in chemistry. So Lavoisier was called the father of modern chemistry, but actually it should not be Lavoisier, Antoine Lavoisier alone. Okay? Gender equality, it's the Lavoisiers. There is Antoine Lavoisier and his wife Mary Ann Pierret Paulson. Wherever Lavoisier is doing experiments, she is there with him. All the old drawings have her also here in the, in the lab working with him. OK? Very simple. Why? Because in those days, there was no DST grant to write for. You needed money to do experiments. The easiest way to get money to do experiments was to marry somebody rich. <laughs> OK? So Lavoisier married into a rich family, and they had money to do experiments. And you know, uh, Mrs. Lavoisier also liked to do experiments, so it was OK. And Lavoisier is important because he introduces the idea of making measurements. It's not enough to say x goes to y. You know, so many grams of x gives me so many grams of y plus whatever z or something else. He makes it quantitative, comes up with the law of conservation of mass and reactions, etc., and makes, you know, and hence it's very important. But Lavoisier also classifies elements. And Lavoisier writes the first textbook in, in French, 
This is in the English translation would be the elementary treaties of chemistry, where he makes a list of simple substances that can't be broken down. And at this time, you have lots of things like oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, mercury, zinc, etc., etc. Surprisingly, today you may think that he has light and heat as elements. But it's not that surprising. Just look back 300 years ago. I mean, you are taking mercuric oxide, putting it in the sun, getting mercury and, and uh, oxygen. So mercury oxide plus heat equal to mercury plus oxygen. You will think heat is an element. Not unreasonable. OK. Uh, and there are many oxides in this table, um, silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide, etc. Now it's very difficult unless you have electrolysis or some you know, reduction with sodium or something to be able to uh, make the metal out of it. So he th thinks that they are also elements. But the story of Lavoisier is not that, not yet complete. So remember I said he married into a rich family. Lavoisier's father, I mean Mary, Mary Ann's father had his company called Ferme General. Now how did Ferme General make its money? It was a contractor for the king to collect taxes. So his family is a tax collector's thing. Now, naturally, if you're tax collectors, you're not very popular in the general public. Or if you must have filed your returns right now, right? I mean, so uh, Lavoisier being a scientist, the first thing he did is he figured out all the loopholes where people are avoiding taxes. And ek ke baad ek, he stopped all of this. So people were really unhappy because he made it very difficult to evade taxes. He was not very popular. The next thing is. Ferme General also worked on collecting taxes from tobacco. Tobacco was a major source of thing. Remember, tobacco doesn't grow in Europe. Tobacco is coming from outside. And hence, people who are importing tobacco, there is a lot of money to be made if I can adulterate tobacco. And moist tobacco is obviously going to be heavier than dry tobacco. OK, so there's rampant adulteration of tobacco. And he finds that you know if you add water, it apparently improves the taste of tobacco. I don't know all this. But anyway, he does experiments and figures out that 6.3% of water is the maximum you can do. Anything more than that means you have adulterated the tobacco. So people are even more unhappy. You're denying them their cheap smoke. OK? Now the French Revolution happens. The French Revolution happens, and Lavoisier is arrested. And he is charged. For what? What is his crime? His crime is adulteration of tobacco with water. And for this crime, he is guillotined to death. And the judge says at the trial, we don't need these scientists. OK, unfortunately, people say that even now. <laughs> That's the dangerous part. OK. Anyway, long story. But the moral of the story, the moral of the story is 300 back years ago, or even today, tobacco kills. <laughs> OK, let's move on. Now, in, in, uh, in his lab, there is an, there is, this is Lavoisier. There is an ass, uh, assistant. The assistant manages to escape. And now, if in Europe, in that time, if you're escaping the revolution, the best place to go to is America. So this guy goes to America. His name is Long. I have lots of long French names in the talk that I can't pronounce, and I murder the pronunciation, but forgive me. Uh, the main point is, look at this. This is the beginnings of the DuPont family and the DuPont Chemical Company. The DuPont Chemical Company comes out of Lavoisier's lab. OK, today a big global player. But this is whatever, this big guy who's here. OK, now in the 1800s, lots of more elements have discovered. People are now trying to find trends. And the first guy to find trends is this uh, a German. Uh, he basically says that, look, there are elements with similar properties. And when you have these elements with similar properties, the Atomic weight of bromine is approximately chlorine plus iodine divided by 2. Atomic weight of strontium is calcium plus barium divided by 2. There are some sort of trends in this. So he says there are triads, okay, but just empirically. Uh, and then you know more and more by Gmelin, who has his handbook of chemistry, has 55 elements. Now, an important thing is accurate measurements of atomic weights. And this is actually first done by an Italian chemist, Canizzaro. Now, if you've done organic chemistry, you might have heard of a Canizzaro's reaction. But Canizzaro also worked on uh, finding atomic weights based on the, another Italian chemist who was his friend, whom you've definitely heard of, Avogadro. Okay. So these guys uh, present their findings at the first international conference of chemistry, which is happening in those days. Germany is the center of all science. It's happening at Karlsruhe. And one of the attendees in the audience is Dmitry Mendeleev. Okay. So, uh, by this time, there are lots of other people who are also arranging elements. There is another French geologist, Emile Beguer de Chancontoire, okay, whatever it is. 
he develops this thing called a, it's like a 3D periodic table, a list of elements. Unfortunately, he publishes it in some geology journal. The chemists don't know about it, so he gets lost. Then we have Newland's octaves. Newland's comes up with this theory from music. He's inspired by music and he says, look, there are properties that after every eight elements is repeating, after every seven, the eighth element is repeating. It's very similar to music, so he's co completely going on this music track. And because he only has a theory, he can't publish. How different than today, okay? But Newland's contribution to chemistry is he's the first guy who gives this word periodic in chemistry, okay? So the fact that properties are periodic. And then there are others. Uh, there is Meyer and Oodling. They are arranging by atomic weight. Now they are starting to arrange by atomic weight. Meyer is the most um, influential of these. Meyer publishes it in a book, The Modern Theories of Chemistry, in 1864. This is five years before Mendeleev, please remember. And he has it almost perfect. Okay? He has, this is valency, one worth, two worth, three worth, four worth. Look at this, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. He has it in place. The only thing is, he's published in a book, not in the regular scientific journal. And later on, Mendeleev and Meyer will fight about who got it first. OK? Uh, let's meet Mendeleev. It's time to come to Mendeleev now. This is the typical Mendeleev picture you see with this long flowing beard, old Russian guy. But Mendeleev was actually born in Siberia. He was one of 17 children, of whom 14 died in infancy. Three of them survived. We don't know what Mendeleev's father did. Many different reports. Some people say he had a printing press. Some people say he had a glass factory, etc. But he passed away early, and his mother was very keen that Mendeleev must be, I mean, Dmitry Mendeleev must be educated well. So from Siberia, there's nothing good over there. She takes him on a journey of 2,000 kilometers by horse cart to Moscow. Okay? And in Moscow, they tell him, sorry, boss, no admission for you. In Indian terms, they would say, domicile nahi hai. You're from the other place, no domicile in this place, you can't get admission here. He is not deterred. He eventually goes to St. Petersburg, and he joins a pedagogical institute for teachers. Okay? And uh, he graduates from there. But the north of Russia is very cold. He falls sick, and uh, he moves to the south of Russia. Uh, and he starts his job as a science teacher in a high school. Mendeleev was a science teacher in a high school. Okay? And he was doing this. Eventually, he recovers. In 1857, he goes back to St. Petersburg. He says, OK, I want to do research. I want to get a PhD. Now, the place is, in those days, the place to go is Germany. So he goes to Heidelberg. right? That's the place he goes to. And because of that, he's able to attend the Karlsruhe conference. And he does his research, and he gets his PhD degree. In those days, it's a DSC degree. Nothing to do with periodic table. His DSC degree, his thesis is called On the Combinations of Water with Alcohol. And I know several people in most IITs who have great experimental evidence of doing this. <laughs> OK. Uh, so Mendeleev, as a chemistry teacher, wrote a textbook of organic chemistry. He also wanted to write a textbook of inorganic chemistry. Then he says his arranging atomic waste stuff is not working out. Kuch to ghafla hai, let me solve it. And he decides, I will arrange the things by atomic weight. We'll come to that. But apart from that, Mendeleev did a lot of stuff. He was responsible for getting petroleum industry started up. He was responsible for metric system in Russia, a lot of work on explosives. He did lots of different things. The one thing Mendeleev did not do is he did, he did not come up with the composition of vodka. The people claim that vodka, 40% alcohol, is because of his thesis. That's just a marketing gimmick. Okay? Uh, Mendeleev is not responsible for vodka. This is pure, pure marketing. OK. All right. <laughs> Let's get to Mendeleev's periodic table. This is the first periodic table on which we find a date, 18th February 1969. Uh, 1869. And it's, it's 90 degrees inverted. Instead of carbon silicon this way, it is carbon silicon germanium this way. OK? And uh, he has left lots of question marks. I'll show you a better version of this. There are question marks over here where he predicts elements. And he gives them these names of Eka something, Dvi something. So the one below silicon is Eka silicon. The one below manganese is Eka manganese, Dvi manganese, etc. Why did he give them these names, Sanskrit names? Because he had a friend, Otto von Bertlink, who was a, he was a studying Panini's works. And he was very impressed that the consonants, if you look at any Indian language, the way we look at our consonants, kirk, her, gurg, her, jur, 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 etc. I mean, they are arranged in rows and columns. Mendeleev thought, I can come up with this grammar of the elements. And because he had this friend, he gave these Sanskrit names. 
Okay. And the good thing is, Mendeleev published his work in the most important journal at that time, Sightshrift Fushemi. It's like publishing in Science or Nature today. And he went around giving lectures. You know, Faraday lecture, Professor Mendeleev will speak at half past 8 o'clock PM, etc. So he did a lot to publicize his periodic table. We know his periodic table, not Myers. Now, Mendeleev, Mendeleev's genius is not what he put in the periodic table, but what he left out of the periodic table. The places that he put in. The power of insight in arranging these elements and predicting their properties. So he says he leaves these question marks over here. Below aluminum, he not only says that there will be an element, so Eka silicon, it should have an atomic weight he predicts of 70. Germanium is discovered with 72. Eka aluminum, gallium, he says, will have an atomic weight of 68, density 5.9. When we find it, it's 69.7 and 5.904. He can predict properties just based on looking at this. And that, I think, is the key thing. Okay. The other thing is, he had faith in what he was doing. In some cases, like tellurium and iodine, he puts iodine after tellurium and says that it's not in the order of atomic weights, but it has to be your atomic weight measurements are wrong. And eventually, they remeasured it and found that Mendeleev was right. Mendeleev didn't get everything right. For example, he puts uranium in the aluminum column here. Okay, it's not that Mendeleev got everything correct. Okay. Gallium is an interesting guy because it's a nice story. Gallium is discovered by yet another French guy with a long name. Okay. Now his name, and he calls it Gallia after Gaul, France, but he very cleverly names it after himself. Because his name is Lecoq de Boswell. Lecoq is the French for the rooster, C O C K cock in English, and the Latin for rooster is Gallus. Okay, and then Gallium. So it's a very smart guy. Okay. Now, after this, of course, nothing much happens. Still, the noble gases are discovered by Ramsey and Raleigh and all. Mendeleev then adds a group zero in 1902. Now, Ramsey and Raleigh get a Nobel Prize just for discovering the rare gases, the noble gases. Mendeleev is also nominated the same year, does not get a prize. Mendeleev is nominated again in 1905. In 1905, Moissan isolates fluorine. And he gets a Nobel Prize for isolating the most reactive element, fluorine. He gets a Nobel Prize for that. Mendeleev is overlooked again. Once you're dead, no Nobel Prize. Now, later on, it, it turns out that Mendeleev was nominated several times. And the Nobel Prize is given by these Swedish big bosses of chemistry. And the chairman of the committee was a guy you've probably heard his name, Arrhenius. You heard of Arrhenius reaction rates and plots and all that. Now, Mendeleev, unfortunately, had a fight with Arrhenius sometime in his career. Okay, and when there was a tie in the committee, chairman decided, mm -mm. <laughs> moral of the story, don't take panga with big shots. Okay. Now, the next problem you face is in 1913, where Saudi discovers isotopes. Now you have a problem. You were arranging by atomic weight. You gave one box to every atomic weight. Now what do you do? Do you give hydrogen, deuterium, tritium? One box each, carbon 12, carbon 14, do they get one box each? What do you do? You have a problem. Arranging by atomic weights is no longer easy. The solution comes, thankfully, just a year later, by mostly, mostly discovers that the X-ray lines, the X-ray wavelength depends at only on the atomic number. And then from that point on, the periodic table is arranged by atomic number and not by atomic weight, giving us the modern periodic table. And mostly has this very beautiful graph. This is also a kind of periodic table. It shows the square root of the X-ray frequency versus the number of elements. And it's a beautiful straight line graph. And this convinced people that atomic number was the way to go. And you'll see the blanks. 61 is blank. 43 is blank. These are not known. OK. Unfortunately, he does this in 1914. The World War I starts. 1915, he is sent to battle and unfortunately gets shot dead. Poor guy, one of the biggest losses to the world of science. After this, the British government decided that all these high-profile scientists, please don't send them to war, okay? which was a good decision. Okay. So this is how Mendeleev's table looks like in 1904. Uh, nothing happens till Seaborg. Seaborg is another pioneer, 10 elements discovered by him and his group. He decides that this table is getting too wide. Let's put the lanthanides and these newly found actinides, let's put them outside. So that's why you have them now out, down outside the main thing. Otherwise, it'll get way too long. Okay. And Seabar was the only other person who has had an element named after him when he was alive. Okay. Now, of course, we know that the modern periodic table, you know, you have this S, P, D, F blocks, and you can fill them with Hund's rule and things like this. We know this. Okay. But this is not, not just one day's work. This is work that has happened 
over a period of 100 years and contribution not just from Mendeleev but by lots of other people as well. Okay. So today, the official IUPAC table looks something like this. This is the table, and it's not perfect. OK, look here. These guys are supposed to be there. This is what you call the f-block elements. But the f-block, f-shell takes 14 electrons. Yeah, but there are 15 elements here. So who should be here? Should we put lanthanum and actinium here? Should we put lutetium and laurentium here? For a long time, we had two different variants of periodic tables with either of these options. IUPAC decided, let's put everybody there. OK. The position of hydrogen has always been a little iffy. Hydrogen can lose an electron and be happy, like the uh, alkali metals. Hydrogen can gain an electron and complete its shell and be happy, like the halogens. So hydrogen can be either here or there. Again, not very clear. How about an element 0? Should there be an element 0? No, not really. I mean, if the periodic table is supposed to represent the things that make up the world around us, today we know what would be element 0. It has no protons. Atomic number, number of protons. Element 0 has no protons. It's a neutron. Today we know that a lot of the universe is made of pure neutronic matter. We have neutron stars. right? So maybe the neutron should be part of the periodic table. Who knows? We'll see. Okay, so there are many, many, many variants of the periodic table. The other, other problem, which is from argon, I have to go to uh, potassium on this side. You can imagine bending the periodic table around and sort of joining it up, so it becomes a spiral. So cylinders and spirals are not new. Meyer had a, a spiral version after 10 years. Uh, this thing is effectively a spiral, 1862. This is also a 3D table. You can consider it the first 3D table. Uh, Ramsey, every scientist has come up with some periodic table. One of the, all these big names, they have got their own periodic table. Ramsey had something like this, 1904. I like this. This has character. This is not boring. I mean, it may not tell you anything new, but look at this. It goes hydrogen, helium, goes this way, then it goes that way, then it goes this way. I mean, this has character. You can't say that this is a boring periodic table. OK. Uh, Soddy, isotopes guys, comes up with a with a spiral like this. The problem is Saudi is he's one of these scientists who, after getting the Nobel Prize, sort of uh, went bonkers, in short. He decided to focus on economics. And uh, he came up with a theory of Cartesian economics, okay, and things about virtual wealth and debt and solution to the economic paradox. He was actually talking about stuff like bitcoins, virtual wealth and all that. But in those days, people thought he was completely nuts. Anyway. now. Uh, you have to have fun. I hope you're having fun. Right? I'm from the Institute of Fundamental Research. So you should have fun. Uh, and there's no fun unless you add pseudoscience. It's the flavor of the season. Right? And our Indian politicians have a habit, or you know, leaders, of saying stuff in public right? uh, uh, you know, about, for example, gravity. You've heard of all this gravity stuff going on. right? Now in those days, 100 years back, it was chemistry and the periodic table. Okay. And here is a statement, public statement. Who needs experiments? The structure of chemical elements can be assessed through clairvoyant observation with the microscopic vision of the third eye. Aag band karko, imagine you'll find elements. Okay? This is a book. It's called Occult Chemistry. And it's published by Annie Besant. You heard of Annie Besant in the history books. They also came up with a periodic table. And their periodic table looks like this. Thoda idar udar, idar udar jata hai. Now, the most interesting of the thing of the periodic table is between hydrogen and helium, guys. Remember, between hydrogen and helium, they proposed two elements. And they were called RDRAM and occultium. Occultium because of occult chemistry. RDRAM because the Theosophical Society headquarters are in RDR in Chennai. <laughs> OK. So that's how you get RDRAM and occultium. OK. Let's get, move back. That was. Fun aside, let's move back to regular stuff. Rydberg of Rydberg's constant, he has a periodic table. This is his original. If you clean it out, he actually starts with electron, neutron, hydrogen, helium, and then goes around in circles. Okay? This is a CRC handbook of 1917, lists different elements. Lewis of Lewis acids and bases. Lewis is his periodic table. Look where hydrogen is, it's over there. You'll see some names you're not familiar with. In the noble gases, Helium neon, argon is A, xenon is X, NT is niton. Radon went through many name changes. It was called niton, thoron, lots of different things before people finalized radon. Similarly, out here, 
Today, you know what is vanadium niobium tantalum. But in the US, it was called columbium for a long time because they wanted to name it after Columbia University. OK, so columbium. And of course, there are all these blanks which are he didn't know. There's a guy called Charles Janet, French Frenchman, who has various, various representations of periodic tables. In fact, think of any geometrical shape, somebody's got a periodic table. OK, so this is a helicoidal periodic table. If this is not, it's too boring for you, the next one is a lemniscate. OK, but Janet also gives us the left step periodic table, where he separates S, P, D, and F. Of course, the only thing we've done is now we've moved this hydrogen helium on that side. But 1928, he had proposed this left step periodic table. Okay. So uh, after that, this is the first monument to a periodic table. This is the first monument, 1934. This is Leningrad's bust outside. He used to work in the Department of Weights and Measures, and that is the periodic table up till that time. Triangles, sure, why not? Spirals. One important thing is, remember I said isotopes. Do every isotope deserve their own box? The answer is actually yes. And if you do that, you land up what is the favorite chart of nuclear physicists, the table of nuclides, where you list all the isotopes that you can get of a particular element. And when you plot this, you effectively get a chart which has neutrons on this axis, protons on that axis. The black ones are the ones which are the stable ones, this valley of stability in the middle. As you go away from it, you get more and more unstable and radioactive isotopes which decay. But this is also a form of a periodic table. OK. You can have a racetrack. You can have spirals. George Gamma, 1, 2, 3, infinity, a very famous popular science book. He popularizes 3D periodic table where the D block would come out and the F block would come out and things like this. This is much more available. You can look at the Alexander arrangement. You can download this uh, PDF and print it out and cut it out and make it. Uh, it has the, the D and the F blocks uh, coming out. It's also a 3D spiral. Skyscraper kind of look. Octagonal prismatic. Choose your thing. A curled ribbon. I like this. This also has character. It's beautiful. I like this. Um, again, this starts off with nit uh, proton and then goes around in spirals. The D block is here. The lanthanides are there. People have made clocks, periodic table clocks, and it's not ended. I mean, if you're Polyakov, you can even publish in Nature Chemistry 2019 that he wants to turn the periodic table upside down. I read this paper. I couldn't find out why. You know, why do you want hydrogen and helium here and the uh, stuff of there? Well, if somebody wants to do it, they do it. I'll end with this. This is a chemical galaxy. This guy starts with neutron, it goes hydrogen, and then helium, lithium, beryllium. It will keep going in spirals, like the spiral arms of the galaxy. And the, the groups are this way. You know, boron, aluminum, gallium, carbon, silicon, things, they, they are going out this way. And this brings me to the point where I say that the periodic table is universal because we find the same elements no matter where we look in the universe. OK. And a few stories about this. We'll start with helium. Why helium? Because helium is the only element that was found from India. And it's the only, the first element which was found outside the Earth before it was detected on Earth. And this happens during a solar eclipse observed from Guntur in Andhra Pradesh in 1868. Please look at the path of the sun. It's crossing the subcontinent this way, west to east. Okay. So Pierre Janssen, he observes a very bright line in the solar spectrum here. And it's at 587 point something. Now, you know that there is an element which gives you a yellow flame and has two very bright yellow lines, sodium. And he initially thinks that this is probably some sodium, a different form of sodium or something like that. He's confused. Now, Norman Lockyer from England, he observed this again. Again, he sees the same thing. He also thinks it's sodium. Eventually, both of them realize it's a new element. Since it's there in the sun, Helios, the sun, it's called helium. Lockyer, of course, is much more famous. He started a journal called Nature. OK. Now, Lockyer did not discover helium from Vijayadurg. Now, there's a story that Lockyer discovered helium from Vijayadurg. Vijayadurg is this fort between Mumbai and Goa somewhere. This is the fort. And there is another eclipse in 1898 that goes this way. Okay? And Lockyer came to India to observe this eclipse. He observed it. He wrote a, a Proceedings of Philosophical Transaction Society, Total Eclipse of the Sun Observation at Vijayadurg. This paper has nothing on solar eclipse. Or, or, sorry, on helium. It's on solar eclipse, nothing on helium. But still, people in Maharashtra, they celebrate World Helium Day on the fort over there. <laughs> uh, TK, it's OK. Science outreach is good. Now, why did this confusion happen? 
Because if you see the original map, this is the old one, 1868 map. 1868 went this way. Guntur is somewhere here. Now Vijayadur would have been in the region of totality. Okay, so fine, some white guy came and did some science experiments. This eclipse, 30 years old eclipse. After 200 years, it doesn't matter. No? They are like, yeah, some, some guy came. He must have observed helium from here. No? So its story is good. Okay, but this, the important thing is, by looking at the light from the sun, we got new elements. And optical spectroscopy has been used very powerfully in to, make, to discover elements of the periodic table. 18 elements have been discovered through spectroscopy. And a lot of this owes its beginnings to work by Kirchhoff and Bunsen. Kirchhoff, the Kirchhoff's voltage laws and current laws, he also was a chemistry professor. His voltage current laws was his master's thesis or something. He had done it, it was so good that they said thesis lelo. Okay. And Bunsen, they are the people who are doing spectroscopy. Now Bunsen wanted, they wanted a clean, you want to look at the color of coming from the element, not from your flame. So they wanted a burner that would give them a clean flame. And they, what is this burner called? Huh. But the Bunsen didn't invent his burner because he wanted a Bunsen burner in every chemistry school textbook or in every lab. In fact, he didn't invent it at all. The guy who made it was a lab assistant, Peter Desaga. But he's forgotten. Okay, but anyway, the purpose of the Bunsen burner was to do spectroscopy. And they, many of the elements get their names from the colors. Rubidium has a ruby red line. Cesium has a sky blue line. Thallium is a green twig. Thallium, uh, green line. Okay, initially there was, there was only didium. Then spectroscopically they found that there, was, there were two elements. There was neodymium and praseodymium, two twins. The, the new twin and the green twin. OK, so they became two elements. So lots of elements have come through spectroscopy. Uh, you, and this is very important in those days philosophically. The people wanted to know, are the elements on Earth the same as the ones in, uh, in the sun or other places? OK. Today, spectroscopy is amazing, amazing. You can look at spectra of individual stars in the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million light years away. Two and a half million light years away, we can resolve individual stars and look at the elements that are there. And you see signatures of titanium, vanadium, calcium, iron, whatever, whatever. We can see this. And if you look at different stars in the universe, you see that the red spectra and the blue spectra are different. But the elements are there. There's cobalt, there's lanthanum, there's samarium, dysprosium, you know, cerium, whatever. But the, the spectra are different because stars have different ways they were born, the, the, way, the times in which they lived, etc. So you can figure out how stars evolve, etc. by looking at the light from them and what elements they contain. And trust the universe to be a very interesting place. There are lots of weird stars. There are stars with unpronounceable names like Prizbilsky star, for example, in which, in which they have done high resolution spectroscopy. Now this is 3606 angstrom, this is 3607 angstrom, yeah? There's one angstrom. In this, you see these lines, and you see elements like Californium, Einsteinium, etc. Elements which we think are not natural elements on Earth. Earth, we said, till, ura till uranium, till 92 or 93 maybe. Right? Out here, you're seeing Einsteinium and, and, and Californium in, in the spectra of stars. Now, we, this tells us that how were these elements formed, and where are they found, and things like this. Well, it depends on where you look. And uh, the easiest place to look is the Earth's crust. Now, the Earth's crust is not representative of the Earth itself, because the Earth's crust is a very tiny fraction of the entire Earth. It's not representative of the solar system or the universe, but that's where we live. So let's take a look at the Earth's crust. Please remember, this is a log scale. So this is 1, 1,000 times more, million times more, right? And 1,000 times less, million times less. Naturally, the most common elements are the elements that form the rocks of the Earth, oxygen, silicon, iron, et cetera, et cetera. Surprisingly, what you call the rare Earth elements are not very rare. If you look at this, there is more cerium than chromium or cobalt. There is more neodymium than nickel. Right? You don't think of nickel, chromium, cobalt as rare elements, but they're actually much rarer than cerium and neodymium. The really rare elements are these guys. They're way down here. Ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, osmium, iridium, platinum, uranium, gold, etc. Why? Because most likely these elements are very soluble in iron. Because they're soluble in iron, when the earth cooled and most of the iron went down into the core, these elements probably went down with them. Okay. So the fact that they're not there in the crust, they're probably there somewhere inside, but you know, we just don't know that. Okay. So you can also color the periodic table in various ways depending on you know, uh, what elements you are. But I think we'll skip that. We'll look at something called diffusion cartograms. These are more fun. Uh, what I can do is I can plot the periodic table with the size of the box proportional to some quantity. Okay. So if I plot the elemental abundance in the Earth, 
Yes, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, etc. Rest of them are don't care. The easiest drawing to make is the elements that make up the universe. If you look at the universe as a whole, there's hydrogen and there's helium. Everything else is don't care. Right? Even the sun over the last four and a half billion years has converted just a few percent of its hydrogen to helium. Okay, so the other elements are really, really low. Let's have a quiz. Here's a property which is plotted this way. What, is the, what property are we plotting here? Look, something is big on this side, something is very small on this side. What's this? Top here is big, bottom this is. What? No. Electronegativity, right. Whoever said electronegativity. How about this? Look at the big ones. Electrical conductivity, very good. So you can plot these. These are fun things to do. Anyway, so there are lots of quirks about the, the abundances. For example, if you look at the solar system, even elements, and again, this is a log scale. So even elements are much more abundant than odd elements. People first found this in meteorites. But even elements are much more abundant than log ele odd elements. And this, this oscillates all the way through. Uh, this is just from nuclear physics, whether, you know, what is more stable than others. It turns out that the even elements are more stable. Finally, you know, how were they formed? I mean, hydrogen and helium are formed in the Big Bang. After that, stars are the factories which make elements. Stars convert hydrogen and helium to, to heavier elements, usually using, once they get some carbon and nitrogen, they can use them as catalysts to sort of make this process more efficient. You can do this till iron. Till iron, you can do fusion reactions that will give you this. Beyond iron, the binding energy is such that it's not energetically favorable for fusion to happen. The only way you make elements beyond iron is you take a nucleus, bang a neutron into it. If the neutron is captured, after some time, neutron decays, becomes a proton plus an electron, electron beta radiation out. Proton stays behind, atomic number goes up by one. Keep doing this and building up the rest of the, the system. You need lots of neutrons. Now, there are two ways you can do it. Uh, ask Anil, he's the boss of all this stuff. He teaches this. Uh, you can either, it will happen in stars, you know, uh, in the core of stars, like you can capture one neutron in 100,000 years or something and do these processes. But, you know, over billions of years, one neutron in 100,000 years also will give you some amount of heavier elements. Or we thought, or most of the papers thought that you can have extremely violent events like supernovae, where the star essentially, you know, grab, like fusion goes off, gravity kicks in, it starts imploding on itself and eventually just bursts out. At that time, it's not one neutron in 100,000 years, but 1,000 neutrons a second are bombarding your thing, you get lots and lots of these heavy elements being formed. Okay. So the original paper was, this is, this is just, this is, it's an IIT crowd, so I can do this. It's very important where you publish and what you publish. Okay. Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle publishes in 1946 the synthesis of elements from hydrogen, but he publishes in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Okay. This has some excitations. There's a paper which has 100 excitations, and that's this one. This is the origin of chemical elements by Alpha Bethan Gamow. Now, this has a very good history. This paper was written by George Gamow with his student, Ralph Alpha. But Gamow is a brilliant publicity master. He decides to call up his friend, Hans Bethel, who's also a nuclear physicist, and says, you know, can I add your name to this paper? And they add his name. The student, Alpha, is really pissed. He doesn't like this, but, you know, boss has said, add the name. And this paper is the Alpha Bethel Gamow paper, better known as the Alpha Beta Gamma paper. And because of this names, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, this is a very famous paper. It's also published in PhysRev, a mainstream journal. Gets lots and lots more hits. Okay. So Hoyle publishes much more papers. Again, he chooses astrophysical journal supplement, etc. But the paper that is the defining paper of nuclear synthesis is this paper. It's called B squared FH because of the, the authors, uh, the Burbages. Margaret Burbage, Jeff Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle. Hoyle is also an author of this. Uh, Let's zoom in. I just show this because in today's world, you would never write a physics paper that begins with King Lear and Julius Caesar, quotations from Shakespeare. Right? It is the stars, the stars govern our conditions, the fault of the Brutus is not in our stars. You publish, you write something like this in the paper, editor will think you're a crank and send it back to you. Right? But this is the paper, October 1957. 
October 1957, synthesis of the elements and stars. This is like the paper for the last 50, 60 years has been the defining paper of how new elements are synthesized. Right? This is it. This is the paper. And the uh, the interesting thing is, the lead author of the paper, Margaret Burbage. Margaret Burbage. She is born August 12, 1919. She is 100 years young. And she's still a professor at UCSD. 100 years young, has been working, has been active. It's amazing. She is just such an amazing personality and has written the most defining paper in this. Now, you know, often, as you saw, that astronomy has given so many contributions to the periodic table. But the latest in our understanding of how elements have formed have come from a totally different source. And that has completely changed what B square FH told us. Okay? And that has come from gravitational waves. Now, the first gravitational wave detection was black hole into black hole. Merging into black hole, we can't see anything. The second detection was neutron star merging into neutron star. Luckily, when this happened, they knew where in the sky it was. And they had optical telescopes looking at that same place. And they could see an optical event. And they could see the x-rays, optical meaning electromagnetic spectrum. They could see x-rays from the event. And when they saw x-rays from the event, they saw that there were a lot of these x-rays coming from this R rapid process or something. And this has completely changed understanding of how elements are made. Now people believe that most of these heavy elements are actually made in neutron star collisions, okay? which is again a good reason for respecting that neutron as a component of what makes us. And earlier, you had exploding massive stars giving you all this. Now, it has changed to merging neutron stars, all the, the, the purple stuff. So apparently, like most of the gold has come from colliding neutron stars. Okay? When two neutron stars collide, they throw off some of their ma matter in the interstellar medium. And you have apparently even planets, you know, like planet whose weight worth of gold and other elements being, being put out. OK, so this is a good point to end. And say that in the last 150 years, from 1869 till today, 2019, the search for the understanding of what makes the world around us has unified inputs from physics, from chemistry, from astronomy, right? And has given us this beautiful thing called the periodic table. And I think it's wonderful that we can celebrate it, celebrate Mendeleev, celebrate all the other scientists who've come up with this. And thank you all for your attention.